Well, you join me today at the wheel of something, well, I was going to say quite unique. In fact, it's yeah. uniquely unique as far as the UK is concerned. I am driving the only Nissan Pulsar XA. Uh, damn it. I'm driving the only Nissan Pulsar XA convertible in the UK, possibly Europe. Come along for the ride. And if you like going out for rides and cars unusual like this one, then do please hit the subscribe button down below and the bell notification in the bottom so you find out when I'm doing the next one as well. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we've got another very, very rare car for you. In fact, as far as the UK is concerned, this is one of one. This is a 1985 Nissan Pulsar EXA or EXA convertible. And I say this is rare in the UK, this is rare everywhere. Do you know how many of these they made? 100. Exactly 100 of these cars in the world, ever. So in 1985, to celebrate 15 years of the Datsun Cherry Shop dealership chain, they decided they were going to do something special. They were going to offer a very, very limited edition car of only 100 units, which was only going to be available through that Datsun dealership chain. And because this is such a rare, special car, what they did, they offered it as a lottery. Each dealer was offered a car to raffle, basically. But you weren't raffling to win a car, you were raffling to win a chance to buy the car. So let's take a little look around the car. So at its heart, this is a Nissan N12, or well, technically it's a KN12, which is the coupe version. At the front, very little has changed. In fact, nothing has really changed. We've got the same very interesting small individual slot grills through the front of the bonnet and more slots in the bumper itself to get airflow into the engine bay. And it is so, so wedgy. It is pure protractor design. This makes Volvos look curvaceous. And the big news here at the front of the car is, of course, pop-up headlights. No 1980s sports car is complete without pop-up headlights of some kind. Is this a good time to mention I'm massively allergic to cats? Uh, now, while we're down here, I will mention this car is white. You probably noticed that. These cars were all sold in red. Hello, cat. When we look under the bonnet in a second, we will notice that it has still got the red on the inside. This was painted white over in Japan before it was uh, exported or imported to the UK. And uh, I've got to say, I think it probably looks better in white than it would have done in red. Now from the side view you can properly see this roof. It's under a tonneau cover now we've put it down. With the roof up it really does follow the coupe lines very very closely uh, in the fabric form. Now like a lot of convertible cars and conversions of convertibles from saloons and coupes in the in the 80s and the 90s we've got a target bar which aids rigidity, gives a bit of rollover safety, also somewhere to hang your, your courtesy light which is always a good thing. Like a Mark 1 Golf and other cars of this era, the roof does sit on top, hence the tonneau cover. Now, although this is the only cut one of its kind in the UK, this actually shares one thing in common with a car I've previously reviewed on this channel, the Toyota Celica convertible. This car was also assembled and converted over at ACS in California. A complete shell of a car was taken off the production line, shipped, crated I get imagine, over to California where the roof was cut off, the T-bar cut in and the fabric hood was created and attached to the car. And this was a massively expensive exercise. They cannot have made money on this, they must have lost money on every car because the cost of first of all developing a convertible roof and a conversion is pretty high in itself and then manufacturing all the individual special parts for it, again stacks up very fast indeed. It's a very high quality fabric fabric hood. They developed their own organic polymer windows for UV and crack protection apparently. As a conversion it's very successful indeed. It's just a shame they didn't go into full production with it because it could have been huge. When you look inside the roof with the hood up you can see how well it was all engineered and put together and the hood goes up and down surprisingly easily. Now here under the bonnet we will find an E15S engine. All of these extra convertibles are the same. There were multiple versions of, of this engine and other engines in other versions of the Pulsar, but this one you've got one choice like it or lump it. Now the E is the engine series, 15 means it's a 1.5 litre and S means it's carbureted because it's got a little carburetor underneath there. They did also do a fuel injected version of the same engine, this is called the E15 E, and there's a turbo version called the E15 ET. In order to get through emissions regulations in various countries around the world, there are lots of sensors in here. You've got a lambda sensor here in the front of the exhaust manifold. You've got a computer control on a carburetor car. You've got EGR tank down the back. It's all here to make the car as modern and as emissions friendly as absolutely possible. In fact, this car will still go through a modern emissions test quite happily. Now, in this form, this particular car makes around 85 horsepower and 121 newton meters of torque which may not sound like much, but the car's not very heavy. It's only 906 kilograms. 
kilograms apparently, which is heavier than standard thanks to all the, the girders uh, welded into the floor behind us. But it's still good for 0 to 60 in 8.8 .8 seconds, which is pretty rapid for a car in the mid 80s and a top speed of 115 miles an hour. Again, more than respectable, pretty good in fact. Now something else you might be noticing in this engine bay are these huge black fire hoses encircling the thing. This is because it's got the most amazing air conditioning you've ever come across. Now as I mentioned that was put together by ACS in California, they did most of the development work on the conversion. In fact the cars were completely assembled by ACS and then shipped back to Japan. Now part of the design brief was that the air conditioning had to work when the hood was down so you can be cooled even when you got the top off. And being a California car that's very very hot. So this is one of the most efficient and powerful air conditioners you're ever going to come across. I think it might actually have a higher horsepower output than the engine itself. I mean, if your freezer ever breaks in the house, bring your ice lollies out and put them in the footwell. They'll stay frozen. So yeah, it's a fixed quarter light just here. And it's curved glass, obviously, because it's a curved door. But this was originally a door from a Pulsar or a Cherry. It's exactly the same, same square door handle, same pressings and everything. But they've gone from a framed door to a pillarless, which is yet more excessive work for a run of just 100 cars. They've had to, they've had to have this quarter like glass cut or made especially, and the, the main winding section made especially, and the window runners have had to be converted or made especially as well, because normally it's a full width drop window. In this case, it's only about half the door is drop glass. So you get more expense. Let's climb in. And there's this red carpet down here. Uh, the owner does have some actual Pulsar genuine original floor mats. However, they don't fit because this floor is a much tighter footwell than our standard because of all the extra bracing underneath the car to make up for the roof being removed. On a regular uh, hard top, this goes virtually vertical down on the inside of the sill. Here it goes in around 45 degrees and you've got more of a transmission tunnel. Interestingly, it is fully open across the bottom of the car. So it's a very nice, wide, airy feeling interior. A nice cabin, even with the roof on. Now, climbing inside the car, we have got a superb T-shelf. This is a full height arrangement, which means you can put the tallest of tall cups up here, and it looks absolutely magnificent. So we are very, very pleased indeed with this. Good work on this end's part here. I'll put this outside again. Don't have risk of spilling coffee on a lovely interior. Now that is surrounded by loads and loads of vintage. We've got small vent into the cabin just there, window vent on the side, big windscreen vent just there. So lots of window vintage to see what's going on in front of you on a cold misty day. And then back into this binnacle area. Check out these beautiful, very, very sensible, legible orange fonts. We've seen a lot of this on Japanese cars of the early 80s in the past. Very clear, very no nonsense. You know exactly what you're getting. You're getting 40 miles an hour getting 2000 rpm you're getting very very bright clear indication your headlights are on your handbrake is on there's no messing here at all it's very clear to see and if your view is obstructed by the steering wheel that is actually adjustable as well so you can find your perfect driving position these guys think of everything one thing that isn't quite so clear to see is over to the left and to the right you can see it clearly from the camera view not from the driver's seat we've got our hazard lights and our parking lights and on the right we've got pop-up headlight on up down and then light switch there as well interestingly they all have different rest positions that's in the center that's flat up that's flat down and even though this is the absolute peak pinnacle most luxurious most amazingly invested car they've ever done we've still got a blanking plate just there for some reason <laughs> madness gone mad i tell you on the left hand side we've got our multiple wiping positions for the wipers and on the right hand side we have got our drum shaped uh, light switch if you flick that to the on position you do naturally get the lights to pop up on their own you don't have to lift the lights on their own then we pull back to the steering wheel this is a very cool red leather more well, maroon almost leather rim uh, metal center part and a leather center part with a nissan logo just here and the horn <coughs> what a horn horn test for maximum wind points and down to the right hand side we have got electric mirrors those door mounted mirrors are also automated so another win just there this is lots of luxury items all around uh, underneath that we have got the bonnet pull and a speaker the speakers are not in the doors they're tucked here underneath the dashboard over to the center underneath the digital clock and the the vintage we've got a small mars bar aperture just big enough for a few bits and bobs uh, lots of 
ventilation controls, including the air conditioning with a very strong max setting, a push button radio, and your 12 volt socket just there. And finally, in this position, which is such a popular place in these uh, center console as Japanese cars of the day, big ashtray which slides out from the center. Over to the left, we have a lockable glove box, complete with some Japanese bits of paperwork. And that's pretty much it. Looking up above, we have got lots of Japanese writing up here on the bottom of the sun visor, which I'm sure is vitally important, but uh, we won't be reading that today. And over in the corner of the windscreen, we have our last, I assume, Japanese tax disc or whatever the equivalent is. Now pull this lever down here, roll the seat forward, and you can climb into the back and we see more unique parts. This seat area is, again, all specially made for these 100 cars. The seat base, I think, is standard, but the seat back is just, what, one of 100 units made specifically for this car and nothing else, although they did still put the Pulsar NX <laughs> fabric on it. The side panels are unique to this car. Everything has been narrowed, obviously, to make room for the, uh, the folded hood back here. So it's only a two-seater now. We can climb in. And it's, well, it's bijou, it's compact, it's squeezing my shoulder quite heavily. Um, it's only got lap belts, oops, it's only got lap belts here in the back, but in order to get out from the back, we have got these little tags to pull to set you free. Now, here we have the bootle area. Now, we should have some slightly different badges on this, but it was uh, when it painted, lost its original badges. There should be the Pulsar and Nissan badges on the back, and also a big bubbly 1980s, a uh, bit cheap actually looking apparently, uh, convertible logo here on the side. Inside, we can see the color red that the car was originally. I think the white actually does look a lot better. And inside the boot, we've got more unique parts. We've got unique plastic uh, furry coated pressings on either side of the wheel arches to give it nice lining. We've got this box section here that the roof sits down into when it's lowered. We've got a nice little light down here. I imagine this is not unique to this car, but a nice little interior boot light. All told, not a bad sized boot for a convertible, but then it was a coupe and a practical family car before it got the roof taken off. Right, so this car starts up on the button every time. It's an auto choke, so there's no worrying about getting things right, pulling the choke and adjusting it. It just goes. It's effectively like driving a modern car, really. There was only one gearbox option with this, which was the five-speed manual. And it was fully synchro as well, so it's easy to snick through the gears. It's a little bit of a it's like hard, rubbery kind of a feel, a little bit notchy but you know, not unpleasant and quite easy to use. Now I'm expecting pretty good things for the ride and handling for this car because there was actually a Pulsar racing series. It was uh, struts at the front, trailing arms at the rear, disc brakes at the front, drum brakes at the back, as standard on the rest of the range. So generally quite a good, well set up car. Although in keeping with pretty much every uh, convertible that's had the roof lopped off a coupe. There is a little bit of scuttle shake and a little bit of wobble. And the car is actually softer and more bouncy at the front than I was expecting. You can feel a bit of wobble through the steering wheel, which is pretty standard. Even things like Saab 900s do it. The steering is light. It's actually got power steering on these, which wasn't standard on all of the cars, all the other models, I should say. But it does have a very light, delicate touch to everything. It's very easy to drive. The speedometer is in kilometers per hour. I did glance down and think, oh, my word, it is incredibly well damped for 80 miles an hour, but that's kph, not mph. And that is something they have done very well with this car, is they've loaded it with absolutely tons of sound deadening. So they kind of mask the fact it's a little bit wobbly and quite softly sprung by turning it into a luxury, comfy cruiser rather than an out-and-out -out sports car. There's not a car you'll barrel through a corner in and try and get the best time around the Nürburgring with. It's very much more a boulevard cruiser. That's the LA look, the LA feel. Fifth gear, we're doing, what, 90 kph, which is whatever that is in miles per hour, about 50, 60. And we're just cruising it just over 2,000 RPM. So it's quite nice and relaxed. It is very floaty though. 
It's pretty economical as well, I'm told it gets high 30s MPG, which is pretty good. And Nissan were criticised with the coupe versions of the Pulsar because uh, people generally thought that, well, do think, in fact still, that coupes ought to have a lower roof line. They didn't do that. It kept the standard doors to save pressing and tooling costs, which does give the coupe a bit of a square, upright, boxy look. That is kind of hidden with the convertible because the black roof disguises that pretty effectively. We've got indicator control on the right, of course. Wow, it rolls on a roundabout. Wow, it rolls coming out of a roundabout. You can feel it understeering and scrubbing even at about 25 miles an hour. <laughs> it's Capri levels of handling. I can see the camera vibrating quite violently on the passenger door. That kind of gives you some idea of what the scuttle shake is like on this car. This is a fairly smooth road for these parts. I know they said 0 to 68.8, but it doesn't really feel quite that rapid, I'll be honest. But it is very smooth. Very quiet as well for a convertible. Not much wind noise going on. Really, the only wind noise is from my own cameras, which are GoPro suckered outside the car and causing disturbances in the force. Those electric wing mirrors on the doors make a big difference to the car. Makes it look and feel far more modern than if it had had the uh, wing-mounted wing mirrors as previous generations would have done. It is an absolute sea of red. I was going to make some comment about a butcher's nightmare or something, but I know I'll get taken apart in the comments about being insensitive. Wow, it leans. But this is just such an incredible rarity. A hundred cars sold by the opportunity to buy one via lottery through only a select few dealers and only in Japan. It's incredible that any survive at all. Working out the numbers of them is really hard. No one really knows how many are left because many of them were exported because of the Japanese uh, rules about cars that are over a certain age having to be either taxed exorbitantly, scrapped or exported. Mostly they, I guess, did go abroad. And then the registrations were changed. They were all identical spec, identical colour. So figuring out which car you're looking at could well be the same car three times. It might be three different cars. No one really knows how many are left. Either way, it's astonishingly rare. It really was just insane that Nissan spent so much money producing such a low volume car. Sure, it's a celebration of a landmark achievement of their 15 years of a dealership chain, but even so, it's just mental the amount of money they spent creating these cars, designing them, shipping them off to ACS in California to build them. They must have lost money on every single car, surely. <coughs> But hey, I'm glad they did. They were riding high at the time and they could afford to take indulgences like that. Any other time in their history, it probably wouldn't have happened. And the owner who bought this had wanted one of these for a long time. Never thought he would see one in the UK, never mind own one. And then, then this one turned up and he had to buy it. So it's, uh, dreams came true, you might say. Well, thanks for joining me today in this astonishingly rare vehicle. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different. <laughs>